I read that you studied American Lit in college. So here we are in the Elward offices. I mean, and Jennifer, Jennifer, and I mean. Hi. Hi. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, oh, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> I did. What are your favorite writers, and do you think studying literature has helped you as an actor? I was really drawn to Toni Morrison, and I discovered Adrian Rich in college. Um, can we hypothesize that Bette and Tina are going to be more than what they are now? If not, why well, have them both order cop salad at the same time? Did I do that, Jennifer? Did what I was the intention behind salad? that scene at the outdoor <laughs> cafe? I think that was a Laurel and Jennifer decision. I think, yeah, we should talk about that a little bit. I, I actually did, um, I did a podcast with John Stockwell who shot that scene in which John and I talked about the fact that you we improvised. Both, yeah, the waiter asked us what we wanted and Laurel and I both just ordered cop salad at the same time. And we thought, well, should one person order a cup salad and the other person order something else? And we thought, no, we'll both order a cup salad. Isn't that great? And, you know, and we're very much alike and, and it'll set the wheels turning. Well, I think it's difficult. I mean, um, you know, for those two people to get back together, they have so much work to do. And I think that I would only want to see them back together if, if they really earned it. Mm -hmm. um, I think right now the Bet and Jody relationship is really interesting and it's difficult for me because both of the other actresses are friends of mine yeah. and I, I enjoy working with both of them. Um, but I think that if, if Bet and Tina, if you were to decide that Bet and Tina were to get back together, I, I would hope that would come with a lot of processing and, and really earning it. it. In my mind, anyway, the Bet and Tina relationship is far from over, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not just teasing and being manipulative. It's just there's a lot between these two characters. It comes up, and I'm not sure yet what to do with it. Um, okay, here's a good one. Okay. Um, there are a lot of folks who think that Bet and Helena should get together. Wow. What, what do you think about the idea of a Beth and Helena fling? Wow. Um, In fact, let me just tell you that they call you Bellina. Bellina? Mm -hmm. Beth and Helena. That would be really interesting. I, I don't know. I don't know how that... I mean, it could be fantastic. It could be perfect. Or it could just be a complete and utter nightmare. Because they're just... Um, well, though so Helena's really changed. She's really become this sort of sweet, lovely, if not a little bit lost person. Yeah, it's yeah. true. I think I think that this largely comes out of the fantasy of the two alpha women together, as you know, these two sort of form, formidable competitors getting together. I think if, if Rachel were to play, well, you said Rachel playing it. If you were to write Helena as an alpha, that could be really sort of interesting and make for really incredible comedy. <laughs> um, how do you approach the responsibility of creating, producing the first pop culture TV show, not only depicting, but focusing on positive lesbian relationships? The way that I approached this from the very beginning is to make the best television show I can within the conventions of making popular culture television. I wanted to make a really good TV show that was entertaining and that reached um, as big an audience as we could reach. And I wanted it to work according to the conventions of good, popular entertainment. No, I know that when you are in the writer's room, you're trying to tell the best story possible. But there is implied in any story, politics are implied in any Absolutely. story. Absolutely. Um, I mean, in, in many ways, where, you know, firstly, politics are embedded in the stories and in the themes mm -hmm. because the characters have politics and we get to talk about the world in, you know, through, through characters' points of view. Um, and everything that we do is political and particularly when you take on a project like this, mm -hmm. there are political implications. But I think that 
the most important thing that we can do politically is to make it work, is to create a show and characters um, that people want to come and watch week after week because they're entertaining. Why don't you go to the L Word conventions? Why haven't I gone? Why haven't you gone to an L Word convention and will you ever? <laughs> um, I haven't gone to an L Word convention um, because I'm so much of a hermit that it's very difficult for me to be. I mean, you know, like I'm here like this with the whole podcast. It's very hard for me to be with a large group of people who are paying attention to me. It's very unnerving. I actually do know that, and I know that a lot of fans would, would love you to go to an L-word convention. It's really hard. It's really, really, like, really hard. It's, it's, it's hard. And, I don't know. And, and maybe, you know, maybe one day I'll get together to be able to go. Okay, here's a Valentine's Day question. Okay. In honor of this day, yes, um, in honor, of this day. In honor of this day, what is the most absurd, embarrassing, or humorous thing that's ever happened to you on Valentine's Day? One of the most lovely memories I have is coming home um, after a particularly difficult day, and my husband had written out, I love you, in rose petals right outside the door. The L word. Corey Will and Carleen. Okay, she'll be right there. Hold on a minute. Which lounge? Seems like so many. This one's fine. Okay. The L word. Hi, Joe. It's Jennifer. I am because I'm, yeah, because Eileen ditched me. She's on the phone call. The L word. I think it's this one. I'm going to call for two. The L word. The L word. The L word. I'm terrible. Very patient because I really don't know what I'm doing. You've got the job done for. Oh no, I don't. I'm like hell not at whack. Um. Okay. Will Sarah shocking? Ever return as Carmen? Why does it appear that Shane hasn't fully come to terms with what she did to Carmen? Um, two questions. Will Sarah, will Sarah Shahi ever reappear on the show? Um. I hope Sarah Shahi comes back to the show. She's not coming back in season four, but I'd love to have her back in season five. We all parted friends. Can I have some scenes with her? I never got to work really with Sarah. I think and that I would think be she's great. Fantastic. Okay. And I really love that. You got it here. Okay. If, if Sarah Shahi will come back in season five, she's going to have something happening with that. Not necessarily. Really love scene. Don't just not jump there. Scenes. Okay. That said, at the end of season three, Shane leaves Carmen at the altar. We go into season four, we don't mention her a lot. Why? Um, I mean, I think that we do talk about it from time to time. She certainly is mentioned in the first couple of episodes. Shane goes to see her. You're faced with a story decision that you have to make because of something outside of the story, because an actor is going to do something else and not coming back to your show. And then you have to write to that fact. Um, and that's been another one of the comments that we've gotten a lot. Why do you know? Why is it that Dane has just disappeared? Nobody ever even talks about her. I think that it's a given that in their lives, these people probably do talk about Dana a lot. But the decision to dedicate screen time to talking about this loss, um, I think, wouldn't be the best use of our precious. 45 or 55 minutes. And do you regret writing Dana's death? I don't regret writing Dana's death. I really believe in that story and I believe in the decision to tell that story about that character. I wish that we had had more time to tell it. Mm -hmm. What I regret is that we only had 12 episodes and a huge and really important story had to be told in a somewhat abridged way. How did you come up with the inspiration for the Max character? Is he based on a person you have experienced in the name? Um, no, I didn't before I did the album. I didn't know Max in my life. But a lot of the writers I worked with had that story. The first person to really talk about transgender people 
in our writer's room was Gwen Turner. Mm -hmm. When we started talking about it and we all realized how many people's lives, how many, how many gay women have known um, transgender people who have had girlfriends who became boyfriends, have dealt with issues of gender and identity, we realized that as we went down the road, we would want to tell that story. And were those people isolated in a way? And it, it seems like in the show sometimes that Max is a little bit isolated. He, he's not as much a part of the group as, you know, some um, of the other characters. I think that that's less true in many people's lives. I think that most people find community. Probably relatively few people would be as isolated as Max. Okay. This is a question I know you've been asked a lot, but I'm going to ask it again. Okay. Was it difficult to accept the role of vet? Were there specific risks in accepting it? What was it about the L word and or vet that drew you to this role? Uh, it wasn't difficult at all to accept the role of vet. I thought um, she was a really wonderful uh, character. And, and after speaking to you after that first meeting, um, I realized there were so many places you could go with a character. And I and I also remember early on, you'd given me a script and asked me uh, if I responded more to Bette or to Tina. That's right. Because Tina hadn't been cast yet. And and I was drawn to Bette more because she seemed more troubled in a way. She seemed like she was hiding a lot more with, with this sort of alpha behavior. Um, so that was that was interesting to me, um, and I just didn't. I never felt that there were any risks involved. I didn't even think are there any risks involved. I mean, it was really like. And I know I've said this before, but it was really like somebody just dropped this amazing present in my lap, and I thought, wow, am I lucky that I get to not only to play this character, but that I've met all these amazing women on the show. The cast is so fantastic, and I learn from them every single day that I'm with them on the set and have developed friendships and, and I've never met a more supportive cast, male or female. And uh, I got to meet you and our wonderful uh, crew in Vancouver and I just, the whole thing has just been lucky, 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 lucky day. So I, I, there were no risks involved, didn't even think twice about it. I'm, I'm feeling the sugar crash. <laughs> This person asks, how much of the actresses' personalities are reflected through their characters? That's an interesting question, because it differs from person to person. I think it has a lot to do with how an individual actor works. There are some actors, it seems to me, who really disappear into a role. I mean, for me, I, I enjoy not having anything be too close to me. I mean, I remember when I found out I was pregnant. I was in a story meeting. I get to the phone, and it's Jennifer. And she says, I just had an idea. <laughs> I was trying to break it to you easily. It was just, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want you to faint or anything. Because you just, you know, written Laurel's pregnancy. I think I actually cried, but I'm not sure whether I was <laughs> crying out of happiness for you or out of... It's the that part of what I was going to have to figure out. Yeah, I mean, there's, like, for example, my pregnancy I didn't want written into the show. Yeah. A, because I don't think Beth would get pregnant, and it would be completely arbitrary and and only in service of my comfort, um, which I didn't think was the right thing to do. Different people have different ways of wanting to deal with those personal issues. Laurel wanted and was very willing to have her pregnancy. And she was fantastic. It was, was really fantastic. fantastic and brave. And But I think that it was also, I mean, I think you're right, it was the right story decision too. Right. After all of that, that was not going to have a baby. No, no. I mean, no, no, there's no way. I mean, I actually had thought about it and when I was thinking about the character, I just thought there's, why on earth would that go get pregnant? That last scene where we had the fight on the bed was probably the most intense scene that I've been a part of really, really intense and people still talk about it. Even though still everything was so choreographed as we always do, like everything, um, but it still was very intense. And I, and I remember that Tony 
go over and the director kept the camera running and we would just go back and we'd do it again and do it again. It was, I, mean, I, I sat on set while you were shooting that scene and it was one of the most draining experiences. Yes, it was very draining. I have to admit that in writing that scene, I didn't really know that it was going to become that. Um, do you ever read message boards for the L word, and are you ever surprised by how certain storylines are perceived and interpreted? Yes and yes. <laughs> yes, I do read the message boards, and yes, I particularly read virtually everything on our chart. I think that it's the, the deal that we made when we created this site. How do you feel as a straight woman? knowing that you've helped a lot of women, a lot of gay women, to come out or to live their lives more openly. Does it have an influence on your inner self? Do you feel closer to the world by getting to understand gay love without being gay? I think for me, it's just, it's an incredible honor to be a part of a show that is not only entertaining, but is so deeply meaningful to so many people, and that is helpful. I think in my heart of hearts, I aspire to be helpful, even though I have my own, you know, craziness that I have to overcome. I think that what I would really wish for is to be helpful. And if I have in any way been helpful to people, even just a few people, um, then I'm really grateful. and. And how does that affect my inner self? That was the next one, right? I think in a way it gives me a certain amount of courage to live as authentically as I can. Mm -hmm. And even in the small moments of my life. And I think how it helps me internally is to, and I think this is also part of the third part of that question, is that it helps me recognize how we are truly all connected and that one person's actions can so clearly affect other people that they've never met and uh, and having said that I realize that for some people they may categorize it as gay love and for me I just simply see it as love and there are no, there's no corner of the universe where love cannot abide and 